Meine Damen und Herren, ich heiße zum heutigen Vortrag willkommen und bin particularly grateful to Scott, Scott Barrett for accepting the invitation to talk to us tonight. Scott Barrett was trained as an economist at the University of Massachusetts, then the University of British Columbia, and obtained his PhD crossing after having crossed the ocean at the London School of Economics. He has been teaching then at the London Business School, then at John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and finally since 2009 at Columbia. This is his academic track, very short. But then he has been involved in a number of national and international think tanks on both sides of the Atlantic, in and out, and sometimes staying in such think tanks for a very long time. I mention only two of them. He has been for a long time chair chairman of the advisory board of the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics, a research institute operating under the roof of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in Stockholm. And he has been advisor to the International Task Force on Global Public Goods, again in Stockholm, created by an agreement between Sweden and France in 2003. Now, he was, as I said, trained as an economist and game theory being an essential part of this training, but to my mind, he is an economist of a special kind. His training seems to have provided him less with an ideology and a worldview than simply with a set of analytical tools. These tools he likes to apply to problems that lie clearly beyond the horizon of the economy and of markets, problems of international cooperation and problems of the environment. The emission of greenhouse gases leading to the warming up of global climate could be seen as one of the most recent manifestations of what economists used to call the tragedy of the commons. And many of them claim that the best way out of such a tragedy consists in privatizing common goods. With global climate, this could turn out to be difficult. But Scott Barrett does not focus on the tragedy of the commons. He focuses exactly on its opposite, on the supply of common goods, and more precisely, the supply of global public goods. In one of his books, he compares the more or less successful implementation of very different kinds of public goods, such as the global standard for the measurement of time, the eradication of diseases as smallpox, the non-proliferation of atomic weapons, the protection of the ozone layer, and the agreements on the mitigation of global warming. In all these cases, he's interested in finding out what are the incentives and what, on the other side, are the causes for resistance. Some kinds of agreements have turned out to be very effective, others not. Why, for instance, was the Ozone Treaty signed 1987 in Montreal a great success, whereas the Kyoto App Agreement on a reduction in CO2 emissions signed 10 years later failed and fails to produce significant results? Scott Barrett tries to determine which strategies are more viable in order to promote effective international cooperation. And reading him, it becomes obvious that he's deeply committed to the subject. But this commitment is never talked about. And there is never, at least as far as I could read, there is never a moral argument. Morals simply do not seem to be part of his game. 
He writes, as Tacitus famously put it, sine ira et studio, with neither anger nor zealousness. Whether his writings and his talk tonight will actually contribute to a reduction of global warming, this I do not know. But even if one remains skeptic about such an outcome, and I guess that Scott Barrett himself is deeply skeptic in this respect, even then I consider it an enormous gain that by reading and listening to him one comes to understand more clearly the difficulties and the complexities of the subject. Intellectual clarity might not lead necessarily to salvation, but it is for sure a good starting point and it is probably the best thing we can aim at in this institution. Dear Scott, thank you for speaking to us tonight. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Luca, very much for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. Wow. Um, so I want to talk to you about climate change, international cooperation, my personal obsession. The world has given more attention, more diplomatic effort to this issue than any issue in human history. Nothing compares to it. For example, the meeting that was held in Paris in December uh, 2015 had over 35,000 people in attendance. The last meeting just held recently in Marrakesh had, I forget the exact number, but 20, 25,000 25, people. <coughs> These negotiations have been going on for over 25 years. There's nothing in human history to compare to the diplomatic effort that's gone into climate change. Now, my question for you is, have we succeeded? Does anyone think we've succeeded? <laughs> you said, I'm skeptical. Come on. <laughs> the audience here is skeptical. Uh, you know, you never really know because you don't know what the world would have done if it hadn't been for all these negotiations. And that's one of the points I want to make, that in this business, when you're looking at these global issues, you have um, you can see the world as it is, but you want to interpret what you're seeing. Was something achieved? Was something not achieved? Could we have done better? Did we want to do better? Do we really want to do better? Do we just say we wanted to do better? And in the kind of work that I do, you can pull back the curtain and you could see uh, what might be going on behind the curtain. So that's the analytics that I use, and that's what I'm going to show you. Um, I would say that all that diplomatic effort we've put into this shows that we want to do better on climate change. So I don't think there is an issue about the will as to why we're not doing it. Um, I think the reason we're not acting, um, we're not being more successful in acting to address climate change is because the institutions that we have were never created to deal with a problem like this. This one is totally different from the ones we've encountered in the past. And I also don't think we're prepared now to modify our institutions to address it. And that's what we're, that's what we're seeing. So um, I'm going to take you through um, a way that I've come to look and understand this. And I'm not a polemicist. I'm not going to try to convince people of anything in particular. I'm just trying to. Um, understand myself what's going on and maybe to share with you a way that you can look um, and understand yourself, come to an understanding of your own about um, how the world works or why it doesn't work so well. So just very briefly on climate change itself, in this image, which is from NASA, you see the areas in uh, red, orange, yellow, they have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. Now, if you shut off the, you notice they're mainly in the northern hemisphere and actually over the industrial areas. If you shut off the emissions and you just waited, 
the CO2 would be distributed more or less uniformly around the world. It's what's called a well-mixed gas. And that CO2 around the world is going to modify the climate because this gas uh, takes in uh, heat that would otherwise be thrown out into space and keeps it and keeps the Earth warm. It occurs naturally, but we're adding to the concentration of these gases in the atmosphere. And since the industrial age, a mean global temperature, which is an average, which no one experiences, it's just an average, uh, has increased uh, 1.2 degrees C. Remember that number because later on I'll mention the 2 degrees C, which of course is the global goal on climate change, uh, or to keep uh, temperature change within 2 degrees C, and we're already at 1.2. And in fact, if we stopped all industrial activity now, temperature would continue to rise for some period of time. So we're already committed, in, in a sense, to uh, more warming than this. Now this CO2, not only is it distributed around the uh, atmosphere, uh, but that CO2 we put in the atmosphere, some of it will stay there for centuries and millennia. So it's a little like a nuclear waste storage problem, except it's in the atmosphere. And to stabilize climate, you have to stabilize concentrations in the atmosphere. And because some of what we put up there will stay there, that essentially means we have to bring emissions to zero. At this point, I want to pause because just think about that. Our entire economic system, the system that's brought us prosperity, or some of us at least, prosperity, has been founded on fossil fuels. We have a lot of fossil fuels remaining underground. And it's very tempting to want to take these fossil fuels out and to burn them to produce energy, which basically produces wealth. And we need to not take CO2 out of the ground, even though it's economically attractive to do it. So we need to show tremendous restraint. And what's difficult, of course, is that if your country shows restraint, which it may be inclined to want to do, that won't be very successful if the other countries don't show restraint. So that's why this is such a colossal collective action problem. That's why countries meet again and again and again. That's why so much has been invested in this process. Um, and it's because, the, um, it's because all countries will be affected by whatever is done, um, but that your own country will incur the cost of acting um, and your own effect is rel relatively modest compared to the global total uh, that countries have trouble reaching agreement, sustaining agreement, and improving on them. So the basic problem here is, I'd say, is institutional. It's that the world is governed by uh, sovereign nation states, and their incentives are just not aligned. The incentives to act on their own are not aligned with the incentives that exist for the whole for all countries together. Now I want to distinguish right away between adaptation, so this means making adjustments to a world in which the climate is changing, versus limiting climate change. Adaptation, if you've ever met cheerful, happy people in the climate area, they probably work on adaptation <laughs> because everyone's going to do adaptation. It'll be universal. Everyone will do it. We'll do it very well because all our institutions are geared for adaptation. Markets, for example, would work very well for adaptation. Uh, provision of local public goods, like building dikes, seawalls, that kind of thing. We're very good at that for the countries that have uh, uh, effective governments. Now, of course, not all countries have effective governments. So one thing that will happen from adaptation is some countries will adapt better than others. And that actually is a bit of a problem because the countries that find it easier to adapt have an even smaller incentive to act to limit cli climate change. So adaptation has a negative side to it. And the countries that are the most vulnerable, of course, are the ones that have already shown themselves to be unable to develop. So I think there's a very real prospect that climate change will widen existing inequalities. <coughs> but I'm going to focus on limiting climate change. So this, um, at the, at the Wissenschaft Kolleg, I'm, I think I'm the third person to show this picture. <coughs> this is the front piece for uh, Thomas Hobbes' famous Leviathan. And what I want to point out is that Hobbes says that to, basically to order a society, 
uh, for mutual benefit, you need a sovereign, I love this, to keep people in awe uh, and, and, and to keep them in, in, in awe and tie them by fear of punishment to the performance of their covenants. Covenants are agreements. So individuals would enter into agreements and they could rely on the, call it the state, to uh, enforce the agreement, and that seemed to be a precondition for effective um, economic performance, amongst other things. Well, at the global level, we don't have a world government. And actually, when you think about it, it would be pretty hard to construct one. How, under what set of rules would we make a decision for what to do? And would we really be willing to give power to a world government over us. So that's, uh, as, as bad as things are now, when you start looking at the alternatives, we, we, ha we have to address a problem like this with one hand at least tied behind our back. Now what countries can do is they can enter into, into agreements, like the covenant, but these have to be self-enforcing because there's no world government to enforce them. And an agreement only has to do three things, which sounds very easy. First, you have to attract pretty much full participation. So almost all countries have to be part of the agreement. Second, they have to do what they said they're going to do. They have to comply with the agreement. And third, the agreement has to ask them to do something. Something, remember, you have to bring emissions to zero. So this is without precedent in human history. It's really easy to do two out of three. For example, you can have an agreement with full participation full participation, full compliance. That's because you're not asking countries to do anything they would have done anyway. I'm going to come back to that later in my talk. We've done that. Um, now, you could uh, adopt an agreement that requires that states do a lot, but then the consequence may be they don't comply. Actually, the consequence is almost sure to be they're going to withdraw. And that, and even just the knowledge that there will be a withdrawal or that a country won't join in the first place is enough to make countries negotiate something that really won't change things very much. So they keep trying, they find it very difficult. This is Peter Kent, he is Canada's environment minister and here he is uh, at the uh, big climate conference in Durban in 2011, that was in December 2011. And after this conference he flew back to Ottawa and then held a surprise news conference where he announced that Canada would be withdrawing from the Kyoto Protocol. And the reason was that Canada had ratified the Kyoto Protocol and adopted no domestic legislation to fulfill its obligations, was wildly out of compliance, and before the term came up, when it had to decide if it was in or out, decided the most convenient thing was to withdraw. And it was very easy to predict that this was going to happen. And of course, the reason that Canada never adopted the legislation in the first place is that they knew that there were no consequences to doing it. Now, what's interesting is people keep saying that what we need are legally binding agreements, particularly in Europe. Europe mentions this a lot. Legally binding agreements are not as important as you might think because the Kyoto Protocol is legally binding. The way to get around your obligation is simply just to withdraw which you're allowed to do under international law. The sovereignty allows you to choose whether you are in or whether you're out. So asking for an agreement to be legally binding, that by itself doesn't change much of anything. What has to happen is the agreement itself has to change incentives. This is the key part of my talk, really. Has to change incentives so that the countries want to behave differently with the agreement than they would have done without the agreement. And every agreement that's good does that. There aren't many good agreements. But the ones that are good change behavior. <coughs> uh, this is my a timeline for the climate negotiations. You know a timeline normally is a, like an arrow? And it conveys progress. <laughs> OK. My timeline is a circle. Uh, we start up here. Uh, so climate change became a political issue in the late 1980s. And initially, uh, uh, countries got together in a kind of in semi-formal way, I would say, in Toronto to decide what they should do, and they agreed right away. There should be a limit on carbon dioxide emissions worldwide. Uh, and after that, of course, none of this was binding, it was semi-official. After that, countries started to announce unilateral declarations for what they were going to do. Um, you can look them up. I mean, Germany had one, the United States had one, 
Canada, New Zealand, blah, blah, blah. It was, everyone had their own agreements, uh, their own pledges, I should say. But then uh, countries were thinking, wait a minute, why should I do this when I can't be sure that other countries are going to do what they said they're going to do? And there was this concern about, will the sum total of all we're doing, trying to do what really add up to something? So then they decided, actually, what we need is an agreement. And they then negotiated, they started negotiating an agreement in 1990. Uh, and then they came up with the first agreement, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, 1992. Every country is a participant in this agreement. Compliance is full. But of course, that's because the agreement, it's almost impossible to violate. So it doesn't really achieve much. But I will come back to it because I think it does do one thing. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, to get countries to do even more, uh, they then moved on to develop the Kyoto Protocol. Now here they negotiated emission limits for individual rich countries, uh, and they were expecting that they could come up with a mechanism to enforce this, but it was clear to me at the time that there was no mechanism that could do it, and they never did come up with a mechanism. They tried to build on Kyoto uh, in Copenhagen, as you might remember that meeting, uh, and that was a disaster. They were unable to do that. I think that was completely predictable. There's a rump from Kyoto that went off into Doha. Pretty much the European Union is the only country that bound by anything here. And then they have their own unilateral you know, pledge to um, reduce emissions. That's a cul-de-sac. That's gone. We don't have to worry about that anymore. The world has moved on now to Paris. Now, the thing about Paris that I'll come back to is that uh, Paris is basically asking countries to make voluntary pledges for what they're going to do. So what's happened, and that's why it's successful, by the way. So voluntary pledges, very similar to where we started. So I think pretty much we've gone round and round for over 25 years, more or less trying to do the same thing without really knowing how we could have done better. And I find this very frustrating because I think we could have done better. Uh, how well have we done? Well, you can't tell because we don't have the counterfactual, but this is what we should care about. These are the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in particular right above Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Um, and this black line is kind of the average you see of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. The red shows the variation uh, in the seasons when in the northern hemisphere the trees uh, shed their leaves or grow new leaves in the summer. So they're expelling and then taking in CO2 out of the atmosphere. But you'll see the trend is very clear. The negotiations started in 1990, the first agreement in 1992. So before we had no agreement, after we've had a bunch of ag agreements, when you look at that picture, are you struck by how successful we've been? <laughs> Again, you don't have the counterfactuals, so you can't be sure. I mean, maybe it would have been even worse. Um, maybe it would have been better. Who knows? But anyway, it looks to me like I don't think we've done very well. Now, these are the actual negotiations. This is from Copenhagen. And you see uh, Mrs. Merkel, uh, Barack Obama, and some others that you'll recognize. Not <laughs> any more in power. Um, in fact, there'll be one person standing, as it were, uh, shortly. Um, so those are the actual negotiations. And when I do my work, I'm trying to understand these. But you know, you can't. Just by looking at those, you really can't tell what's going on because you don't know what they might have done if things were a little different. So what you have to do to understand the international system and issues like this is you have to create imaginary worlds. Okay, and the way I do it is with a little mathematics. Don't worry, I'm not going to do it here. A little mathematics. And in the mathematics, you can't completely trust, of course. They're just another way of looking at things. And so another way to do it is you go into laboratory where you play experiments with people where you're hoping that these people could represent in some way the, w the way countries might behave. So I'm going to show you these two different approaches to understanding the negotiations. So the way to think about this is that they're playing a game. And in fact, the games I'm going to show you will be using either playing cards or poker chips. And here's an a opening game. Um, and that is, imagine that we're playing the game right now in this room, and I gave each of you two playing cards, one red card and one black card, and I asked you to hand back one card to me. Now, the rules of the game will say that when you hand back that card to me, no one else in the room will know which card you handed back. And you ask yourself, OK, so which card should I hand back? Well, that depends. Depends on your payoff. And the payoff you get 
is you get $5 if you keep your red card, and you get one, sorry, euro, and you get one euro for every, <laughs> one euro <laughs> for every red card handed in. Okay, so if there are, let's say, 100 people in the room, and 60 people hand in their red card, each of those 60 people get 60 euros each. And each of the 40 people who didn't hand in the red cards would get 65. They get 60 for the red cards that were handed in, plus five because they kept their red card. Okay, what would you do? Would you keep your red card or would you hand it in? This is what the game looks like. And this is a, a picture that describes the game, and I would like you to look at it because I'm going to show you some other pictures. All you have to do is understand the basics of the picture. So what we've got here, uh, here we've got the payoffs. This is just euros on, this, on the vertical scale. And on the horizontal uh, axis, we have the number of the other players that contribute, so the, other, the number of the other people in the room who handed in a red card. Okay? And there are 100 people in total, let's say. So from your perspective, there are 99 others. So over here, if no one else hands in a red card, and you do, you get one euro, because you get one euro for every red card handed in. If you kept your red card, you would have gotten five euros. But if everyone else hands in a red card, and you do as well, you would then get 100, because 100 red cards would be handed in. But if you kept your red card, you'd get 104. Now, what you see here is that no matter what the others do, you go up here, the payoff to keeping your red card is always higher than your payoff to handing it in. So self-interest is driving you to hold onto your red card. But you realize, if everyone did that, it'd be crazy. Because we're all much better off if we all hand in our red cards. So you're torn. That's why I like this game. You're torn. You don't feel comfortable. You don't, you don't like this game. Now, there's a thing called analytical game theory, and it predicts that everyone's going to hold on to their red card. So this is what's called the Nash equilibrium, a beautiful mind, John Nash, okay. Um, that's the prediction of analytical game theory. Um, if everyone cooperated, they'd be up here. And in many ways, the issue for these agreements is how do you get countries to go from here to up here? But this is just analytics, so it's not meant to tell us what will happen, it's meant to pose a question to us, what do you think would happen? So what do you think would happen if we played this game here? I played this game, a large distribution. I played this game literally a couple hundred times, just as a make-believe game, with every kind of audience you can imagine. And the results qualitatively have always been the same. Some people hand in the red cards, and some people don't almost all the time between one-third and two-thirds will hand in, which is not what the theory says, which is cool. It doesn't mean the theory's wrong, by the way, but it's cool. I think it's cool. And, we should, and what I like about this is you go into this with an open mind now, and you feel the tension. Now, let me show you a real experiment with this. This I did with all my experiments I do with Astrid Dannenberg, who's at the University of Kassel. Some of you have met her um, uh, here at the Wissenschaft College. And here we're playing a game, just like the one I showed you before. There are five people in each group, though. Um, and what you basically, they're playing over um, 20 rounds. Now, in the first round, what happened is uh, three out of five in this group contributed the red card. So two kept the red card. And then they could, they could say, find out what happened, and then they get to play again. Then it goes down to two. And then they play again. It goes to one. And then it goes to zero. And then we stop. We let them try again. They always come back to this with optimism, you know? Hope, <laughs> hope, you know, triumphs over despair here. Let's try again. Okay, now two contribute, and then one, and then it goes zero, zero, zero. Stop. Try again. One. Probably a Swede. Uh, and then zero, 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 zero. And then we stop and say, try it one more time. Uh, forget it. That is, forget it. This picture, for me, describes 25 years of climate negotiations. We've basically been trying. We have been trying. And I think a lot of countries have wanted to do it. But we've not been successful. And the reason is we're caught in this, what's called a prison dilemma. Now, 
You might say, is this really the game we're playing? So let's go to the Framework Convention on Climate Change, Article 2. Um, and this is a very important agreement because this applies to every, all the legal uh, apparatus we have on climate change. And this agreement says that the ultimate objective, basically, of international cooperation on climate change is to stabilize greenhouse gas uh, concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent <coughs> dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And there's nothing in the game I just played with you that implied danger. So let's see what happens if we add danger. So I'm going to change the game a little bit. And let's say in this case that there are 10 players. And instead of cards, we have poker chips. 10 black chips, those are the cheap chips. They're worth 10 cents each. And you have 10 red chips. Those are the expensive chips. And you've got, uh, they're worth one euro each. And you have 10 of those as well. So you have 20 chips. So does everyone. And there are 10 of you in the, in the group. So 200 chips in total. Um, now, in this game, when you hand in a chip, black or red, everyone gains five cents. Okay? And if at least 150 chips are contributed, everyone will save 15 euros. Because if 149 or fewer chips are contributed, everyone loses 15 euros. So you can think of it, if we don't do enough to abate greenhouse gases, we're going to cross a tipping point for the climate system. Some geophysical system, uh, ge some geophysical feature like the West Antarctic ice sheet will collapse, and that will bring a catastrophic consequence for everyone. So catastrophic consequence in this game is you lose 15 euros. Okay, not, not, but we're playing this game with, with German undergraduate students. So for them, 15 euros, they want, they want the 15 euros. Okay. Now, uh, what happens in this game, uh, so here, wh what I've done, this is actually a more complicated game, and I can't really show it in a picture like this, except I I'm doing it anyway. What, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying you have two choices. You can either contribute nothing, or you can contribute 15 chips. The game's more complicated than that, but this is a nice way to show. I want to show in the picture. So uh, this is the payoff to contributing nothing. This is the payoff to contributing 15 chips. And you see, it looks like a prisoner's dilemma here, just like we saw before. The blue line's always above the red line, except over here. And what happens here is if nine others contribute 135 chips in total, and you contribute zero chips, you get 2 euros 75. But if you contribute 15 chips, you get 12 euros 50. Actually, you get a pretty strong incentive to contribute 15 chips if you believe the others will contribute 15 chips. This is not a precious dilemma game. This is a coordination game. And one of the points I hope you will remember is that the, and I've looked at lots of global issues, the world is very good at coordination, very bad at voluntary cooperation. And I think the basic insight is we should ask countries to do what they're good at doing and not what they're bad at doing. But for 25 years, we've kept asking countries to do what they're not good at doing. Now, one issue that comes up in the climate negotiations that people talk about all the time is burden sharing. And it takes up a lot of the oxygen in these climate conferences. OK, we all should act to avoid catastrophe, but I think you should do more than me. You think, you know, there's all that kind of conflict about this. And a lot of people think this is a major reason we haven't succeeded. I think that's completely wrong. I think the burden sharing is relatively trivial. And I should say that I'm probably the only economist who would say that. Uh, so maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but I'll explain to you why I think I'm right. Um, you would think in this game, if you held back one chip, so uh, you know, everyone's contributing 15. You think, well, if I hold back one, and I tell everyone I'm only going to contribute 14, won't, won't someone want to step in and contribute 16? And then I'll come off even better? It's true. You would come off better. But when Astrid and I did this in a real experiment with real people, if you call German undergraduate students real people, for real money in laboratory conditions, it turned out that half the players contributed exactly 15. That was the most common uh, uh, contribution. The average was 15.1. So there were some people who contributed 14. There were more people who contributed 16 because they didn't want to fall short, and they didn't completely trust everyone else. I mean, that's amazing. 
So I think here what's happening in this game is that the incentives to coordinate are just overwhelming. So that the zero-sum element that, you, that people talk about I don't think is important here. And in particular, 15 is a clear focal point. When you negotiate something, you will facilitate negotiation tremendously if you choose something that has an obvious focal point. It just means that people will, it will be obvious to them what they need to do. And the way we've negotiated climate, there's never been an obvious focal point at all. Okay, that's another mistake we've made. Okay, so now the world can coordinate, we're fine. Now, you know, as long as we face catastrophe, we're fine. Well, hold on, because now we have to go back into the science and then look at the uncertainties that exist, and they're huge. Um, uncertainties aren't a reason, of course, for not acting. Actually, I would say the opposite, uh, although I'm not gonna go into details now about that, uh, but they are important for understanding why we have not acted. So uh, the tipping points themselves are very uncertain. For example, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, it might tip uh, for temperature change somewhere between three and five degrees. There's a lot of controversy around this. Um, if it does tip, the impacts are also uncertain. Um, you might get somewhere between four and six meters of sea level rise. It may take a, a couple hundred years. It may take longer than that, and so on and so forth. Uh, adaptation might be easier or harder, depending on, so there are all sorts of reasons why there's a lot of uncertainty, and the question is, does uncertainty matter? Does it change the incentives to act? And I think one of the cool things, and maybe disturbing things, but cool things about climate change is that we're not only playing a game with each other, but we're playing a game with nature. We don't know what she's got up her sleeve. So let me, I did some theory. I'm not going to show you the theory, but I'll just tell you about it. It makes very strong predictions. It predicts that in so uncertainty about the impact, what happens if the ice sheet collapses, has no effect on behavior at all. It doesn't matter. Uncertainty about the threshold, that's crucial. So the science matters. The economics really doesn't matter. Um, and in particular, if you have certainty around the threshold, you have a coordination game, which we're good at. If you have enough uncertainty, you have a prisoner's dilemma, which we're bad at. And unfortunately, this is what we have. So that's what the theory predicts, but we want to test the theory. Would real people behave that way? So let's take the threshold we had before, which was 150 for sure, and now say we're not sure about it. There's some uncertainty. It could be as low as 100. It could be as high as 200. Our expected value is 150, but there's uncertainty around that. And, uh, and also on the impact, instead of being 15 euros, it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 20. We don't know the exact number. Okay? And then we play that game. We get these results here. Now what we've got here are 10 what are called treatments, sorry, four treatments. Each bar represents a treatment. And you have 10 groups playing each treatment, and there are 10 people in each group. Okay? So 400 people are playing this game. And, uh, or they're playing rather, um, groups of 10 are playing 10 different games uh, for four treatments for 40 different games. Okay, so what you have here is you have certainty about both the threshold and the impact. Here you have uh, certainty about the threshold but uncertainty about the impact. Here you have uncertainty about the, thre about the impact but, sorry, here you have uncertainty about the threshold but certainty about the impact and here you have uncertainty about both. Now what the theory predicts is that uncertainty about the impact shouldn't matter, which means these two colors should be the same and these two colors should be the same, which is more or less what you see. And the other prediction is uncertainty about the threshold should be crucial, which means that these colors together should be very different from these, which is obviously true. So let me focus on uncertainty about the threshold. What this shows is if there's, if there's certainty, we can avoid catastrophe with probability, what well, we, we encounter a catastrophe with probability 0%. We avoid it completely. Now, there are two cases out of 20 where there was catastrophe. And you might think, yeah, but what about those cases? Well, it turns out that they're rather interesting. Uh, we're talking real people here, right? This is not math. But it turned out in each of those groups, there was one person who was naughty. <laughs> one person said, that he or she would contribute 15 and contributed zero. 
But that means two people did that out of 200, which my experience traveling on the New York City subway system, uh, you know, they're usually more than 1% of people are crazy. So um, uh, I think that's pretty good. And furthermore, I'm 100% sure that if I let those people try again, they would not do it because they lost big time for doing it. So the incentives when the threshold is known are, are very strong. But when the threshold is not known, we're ba basically heading for collapse, which is, I think, exactly what's happened. That's what we're doing. Now, what do we do about this problem? So what I'm saying is, if Mother Nature gave us a signal that told us, this is the red line, don't cross it, we would not cross it. I trust us. We would do it. We would do the right thing. But she's not giving us that red line. So then, OK, why don't we create a red line? Why don't we create a doomsday machine? So this is my tongue-in-cheek proposal. And that is that we take the readings of carbon dioxide concentrations above Mauna Loa in Hawaii, so they're now about 400. And we're going to program a computer that says that when the concentrations go to 500, a switch is going to be pulled. Now, that switch will connect all the nuclear weapons in the world <laughs> to this computer <laughs> with the instruction that should concentrations exceed 500, all those weapons should be detonated immediately. And once, of course, it's very crucial that once this program has been set, it can't be undone. So now we've strategically manipulated things where the threshold is clear. We know where it is. It's 500 parts per million. I'm very confident, maybe not quite 100%, but almost 100%, that if we did this, we would stay clear of catastrophe. Now, I'm not proposing this. <laughs> um, and Herman Kahn, who, who did propose a, a doomsday machine, he didn't mean it to be taken literally. He meant it as a thought experiment. So if we could do something like this, we would change how we want to behave and that's what institutions do for us. They change how we want to behave. And we construct institutions. So the question is, can we design strategies and institutions that would allow us to change our behavior in a way that's acceptable? OK, now we come to Paris. Uh, wow, cool. So we succeeded. And it really was amazing. And the French did a brilliant job. Amazing that the world, in my opinion, that the world can agree on anything. I find that to be. You know, wow, particularly you know, these days. Like, wow, that wasn't that long ago. The world can agree on anything. It's amazing. And we agreed. But then you have to ask, okay, why did we agree? Well, this uh, picture I'm showing you here was produced by the Framework Convention Secretariat and made available at Paris. And it shows uh, here uh, time. Um, and in the gray here, you have actual emissions worldwide. You see they've been increasing. In the orange, you have uh, projections for emissions under business as usual. So what, it's some kind of guess for what would have happened without a climate agreement. And then you have the voluntary pledges that were submitted by individual countries. And they're added up. And there are these yellow bars here, either 2025 or in 2030. And what you see is the pledges for emissions are lower than business as usual. So the, so the secretariat is basically saying, these pledges will achieve something. Uh, the first thing I would notice, people think that's a success. Well, maybe, maybe. I'm going to come back to that. But notice that under, under Paris, and this is the secretariat. This is not a third party, or this is not ExxonMobil, or something like that. This is the secretariat. Global emissions keep rising through 2030. That's our successful Paris Agreement. And remember, if you want to stabilize the climate, emissions have to go to zero. So I'm not great at math, but I think we're going the wrong way. <laughs> OK? Now, here, this, this, this line here, these are four scenarios that give us a chance of 50% or greater of avoiding the goal that all countries said they want to meet, which is limiting temperature change to 2 degrees C. So we have a 50% chance, even if we go on this, that we'll still blow it. But you have to ask yourself, what's happening here? 
why is it that the agreement we just negotiated that has us go in this direction, what's gonna cause everything to turn around and go in that direction? I call that a miracle. <laughs> and I don't know what it is. <laughs> and I don't know why we should be happy looking at this. I'm not happy, I'm not happy. I don't think this is a good outcome. Okay. Now I did another experiment with Astrid on this, which by the way, I could do before the meeting because I already knew from the drafts what was being planned. So what countries were gonna do that was innovative this time was to create an atmosphere, a structure for naming and shaming. So you make a pledge for what you're gonna do, your country will make a pledge, and then later we're gonna see if you fulfilled your obligations, and the rest of us can you know, pass judgment. We can say whether you think, we think you did a good job or you didn't do a good job. So Astrid and I create an experiment in which we do this. Theory, by the way, predicts that nothing should change. But as I hope I showed you before, you know, theory is a, something you wanna look at, but it's not something you wanna blindly trust, right? What we found, I'm not gonna show you the whole experiment, but what we found is this process of pledge and review, naming and shaming, based on our experiment, will change what countries say. It'll increase the target they set for the collective target, the pledges will go up a little bit, it'll have no effect on what they do. Now, it's an experiment, it may not be right. But what it suggests is, in this picture here, they're showing that these pledges should achieve something compared to where we would have been. And of course, we'll never observe where we would have been, so no one will ever know the answer to this question. But I would even doubt that. I would doubt that. Okay. Now, um, how much time do I have? Because I always have too much to say and too little time. So how much time do I have left, though? None? <laughs> but can, can, no, I don't want to be, I'm terrible. You know, you never give a professor a microphone. He's like, just don't do that. It's like, <laughs> dangerous. I, okay, I'll, I'll go a little bit, and then I think I'm going to skip some of my slides, because I, I, I. What? What would I do? Because I know the slides, and you don't know the slides. Well, maybe I'll, do, I'll skip some, and then if people have a question, maybe they'll, they'll circle back to the slides. This picture here, one of my favorite pictures, uh, this is the uh, ozone hole, which of course is bad. I don't like the ozone hole, that's not what I mean. This is Antarctica, of course. This is the ozone hole. All these Im those images I'm showing you are from computer drawn images from NASA, they're beautiful. And I think when you see an image, I have another image just for you, you know, <laughs> but when you see an image, it just has an impact on you in a way that words on the page just can't have. Um, this, uh, by the way, this hole only opens up in the Antarctic Spring, in our autumn. Um, and it'll fill up later on. Um, but of course, we have this depletion due to the release of CFCs um, since the 1920s. But the main point I want to say is, this is, now things are going to be more positive. It's like, I've depressed you so far, but now I have something good to say. We have one really good climate agreement, except it's not a climate agreement. It's the Montreal Protocol, which is an agreement on protecting the ozone layer. This agreement is brilliant for protecting the ozone layer, but also it turns out the CFCs are greenhouse gases. And the Montreal Protocol is a, a, a Dutch team that showed that the Montreal Protocol reduced emissions of greenhouse gases four to five times as much as the Kyoto Protocol meant to do, but failed to do. Four to five times as much. And almost no one even paid attention to any of this. So without, when we try, we fail. But when we didn't try, we succeeded. Now, I think that's interesting. So why is it? Why do we succeed? Well, if you look at the Montreal Protocol, I think it, there are three reasons. First is, the way it's structured, it limits the consumption of CFCs, you know, these chemicals, chlorofluorocarbons, and the production. So that would be equivalent in a climate agreement. You not only would limit burning of fossil fuels, but you would limit production of fossil fuels, which, of course, no one has dared to talk about. Secondly, there are these side payments. Now, these are to address the burden-sharing problem, particularly between richer and poorer states. And they work because uh, the rest of the agreement works. The final thing, which is really the most crucial thing, is that the agreement bans trade in the CFCs between countries that are in the agreement and the countries that are outside. Now, the reason that's crucial is it changes the game. So the game that would have been a prisoner's dilemma is now a coordination game. That's cool. 
because we're good at coordination. This part here looks like the person's level we saw before, the blue curves above the red curve. But over here, they switch, they cross. And what happens over here is that if everyone else is in the treaty, normally you'd want to free ride, but now if you free ride, you can't trade with the other players, and almost all of them are in the agreement, so you can't trade with the vast majority of other countries. You lose a lot in your gains from trade, so therefore you want to be in. And in fact, the way this agreement has worked is the way that this game theory model I have predicted, which is participation is full, compliance is 100%. You need the trade restriction to change behavior, but because it works so beautifully, trade is never restricted. Wow. So you get full provision of the public good and no restriction in trade. That's, that's like the ideal. Now, we have a, we have, we have a, a, a real climate agreement now that's, that's great. And it was negotiated while we were here at the Wissenschaftskolleg. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, it's called the Kigali Amendments. It was negotiated in Rwanda uh, in October. And this agreement is an amendment, so actually will apply to countries that ratify uh, this amendment. Uh, and it's to control the emissions of something called HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. Now, HFCs don't destroy the ozone layer. They're actually a substitute for the CFCs that do destroy the ozone layer. But they are a greenhouse gas. And they're in the Kyoto Protocol, but the Kyoto Protocol did not succeed in reducing them. This will succeed because this agreement transforms the game into a coordination game. So this will succeed. You may not even have heard about this. I had trouble getting, I've been pushing for this for well over a decade, and I've had trouble getting, even in the New York Times, until they had great coverage in Kigali, but if you go back a year, there's nothing. Um, so this is a great achievement, and now we know why. Okay, now I'm gonna skip some slides. I'm just gonna say that this idea of coordination has never been adopted as a deliberate strategy, and I think it should be. And I've got various ideas for how we could do that. Um, and I also have experiments that can show why we haven't done it so far, but I'm gonna skip this. You want me to do it? You want me to do it? Okay. Because there are, are there drinks at some point? Is that? Okay. Um, now, uh, okay, so this, this is an agreement here that inspired me a lot. It's an agreement um, on protecting the oceans. By the way, when you, when you work in this area, you want to look at all the data you can, which means don't just look at climate, look at everything. Every effort of international cooperation ever, just look at everything. You know, what succeeded, what failed, why, because maybe you can pick up ideas from it. So that's what I do. And this one is successful. This is for protecting the oceans. The country started negotiating, so what happened was you had these oil tankers and you, you, they're basically you know, hollow, you fill them with oil and then you make your delivery and then you have to travel back to get the next load and when you travel back you need ballast. So they fill seawater in the tanks to give ballast so they can travel back and then before they get into the port they dump all that seawater into the sea but of course the seawater now is mixed with the oil that was there before and that's how we would regularly pollute the ocean all the time. Imagine all the thousands of tankers that were doing this. So this was a major environmental issue. Countries started negotiating on this in the 1920s. They tried for 50 years. They negotiated agreements that look a little like the climate agreements. None of them worked. Then in the 70s, a different idea came out of almost nowhere, which was, why don't we require that the tankers be designed differently, where you separate where you put the oil from where you put the ballast water? And they adopted that in the 1970s, and you have full participation and full compliance. Now, why does that work? It works because if you're a port state, you want to protect your coastline. And the way you protect your coastline is to refuse access to your port to ships that don't meet the new standards. If you're a tanker owner, you want to have access to more ports because that makes your tanker more valuable. So as more port states deny entry, more tanker owners want to comply with the new standard as more tanker owners comply with the standard, it's easier for the port states to uh, require that the standard be met, and you get this tipping phenomenon. So we looked at tipping in nature, but a big part of the work I do is about how you can create tipping in, um, in, international, in the international system. 
And this has worked uh, brilliantly. So this is what a, a, a new tanker looks like. The tanks are actually on the outside. This is where the double hulls are. So you get water in here on the return trip. And if there's a collision, uh, you'll just spill some water into the sea. Uh, so this has worked very well. Now, um, this is the classic prisoner's dilemma game. These are coordination games, OK? The question I'm looking at in this research is, why is it if I had this great idea that no one ever adopts it? And um, I think I know the reason. So what happens with the tanker is that when you separate the ballast water from the oil tanks, that means that when you're delivering the oil, you're not using the whole volume of the tanker. So it's actually costly to the tanker to have that empty space. So in other words, if there was a different way to prevent the oil from going into the sea, they would have liked to have done it. The thing is, the different way would have required a change in behavior, which they couldn't uh, achieve. It was the prison's dilemma. So they basically struck a compromise. We'll go with the technology standard because it's easy to implement, um, but we know it's not perfect. And what's happening here, the best you can do in the prisoner's dilemma if you get cooperate, if you cooperate fully, in this particular game is 10. Um, I'm going to show you one game where we, where we can do 10, but with, with this ocean agreement, we had to go down to 8. With the technology standard, we had to go down to 8. So what I'm going to show you, this is the classic prisoner's dilemma game. This is a coordination game because the blue line's ahead of the red uh, to the left of this point, and then it switches. You've got two Nash equilibria, one where um, uh, no one has the new tanker, and one where everyone has the new tanker, except that this is, in this case, you have the same efficient outcome, and the actual tanker story, you're going to have to suffer a loss. You're going to be down here. So what I want to know is, are countries or players more likely to accept this version, B10, the 10 being the payoff to efficiency, or would they be willing to switch for eight, which is less? And I was curious. I thought they may be less willing to switch. So I'm going to now show you the results. Okay. This is what happened when we played. Again, this is, of course, with Asperger. This is what happened when we played the B10. Now, when, they, when, they, when you see the orange, that's the B game they're playing. And when you see this, everyone's at the top here, that means their coordination is perfect. So they started off, and it looked like there was one or maybe two flyers that didn't uh, hand in the red card, but then they all did. Here, they were perfect from the beginning. This, by the way, I think is the Montreal Protocol. It's like perfect <laughs> from the beginning. Here, they started by playing the red game, uh, sorry, the A game, which is the prisoner's dilemma. Of course, they didn't do very well. And then they tried the other one, and they did really well. Here, <laughs> the classic picture for the prisoner's dilemma, really bad. They go to the B game, they do really well. Okay? But here, B, there's no sacrifice, because the best you can do in B is the same as the best you can do with A. So why would you stay with A? Let's go to B. So they go to B. Half the groups go to B right away. Half, it takes one effort, one experience playing A, and they all switch. OK, so this is with B10, which again is when you've got this efficient outcome. But the tanker story is down here. And remember, it took 50 years to get to the tanker design. So now I'm going to show you. That's with B10. Now I'm going to show you B8. You see that small difference in the game makes a huge difference in behavior. Every group now, every single group starts with A. They want A. It's like why we've been negotiating these climate agreements as prisoners' dilemmas for 25 years. They keep thinking they're doing the right thing. But what happens is when they try to do the prisoners' dilemma, this is, uh, this is the picture I showed you before. It just, they don't do well. When they go and they try B, they always coordinate perfectly in the end, always. I think what's been happening with climate is we have not been looking for the B game. We've been pursuing the wrong game. So one thing I've been arguing for is that we should be looking for B game. Um, let me just cover this quickly, and then I want to move on to something else, and then we'll be done. So there's a, this is the new work I've been doing at Wiesenschaft Kolleg. Uh, people are wondering, does he only eat lunch? Uh, <laughs> he stays late after dinner on Thursdays. Uh, <clears throat> having some drinks, uh, but does he ever work? Um, so I've been doing some work. There's a paper, uh, William Nordhaus is a very distinguished economist at Yale University, and he's been working on climate change since the late 1970s. Impressive. Um, he has a new paper out that's really quite provocative called Climate Clubs, and what he's proposing here is that the world uh, tie the trade arrangements of the WTO 
to commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this is quite a provocative proposal. Now what he shows um, is that this linkage of the two issues works, but only up to a carbon tax of $50 per ton CO2. And for reference, by the way, the current price of trading, the emissions trading system in Europe is probably in the neighborhood of seven euros. I don't know if someone else knows the number. I'm guessing it's around seven euros. So um, this seems high, but actually $50 per ton is not that high. The US government has a price that they're using for, uh, well, the Obama administration. Uh, that's $43, so um, we're going to have to go way above that to really take action on, on climate change. And this system of linkage only works for 50, so it won't work if the climate problem is a bigger problem than we are taking it to be now. Um, but the most important thing I want to leave you with is that this approach he takes assumes that there can be no retaliation. So if a group of countries decides they want to link the WTO system to climate, the other countries will never retaliate. And I think that's completely implausible because the, other, the reason you have a WTO in the first place is that I agree not to impose tariffs on you in exchange for you agreeing not to impose tariffs on me. And if I'm gonna impose tariffs on you, no matter what I say, the reason is your best response is going to be to impose tariffs on me. Okay, that's what the theory shows and I think that's very likely to happen or to put it differently, He's assuming that countries, all countries in the world, whether they're in the club or out, will commit in advance not to retaliate. And I think that's not reliable. I don't think they would do that. Now, if they don't retaliate, what he shows is that in many cases you get, I, I constructed a game, this is not what he shows, but this is my interpretation of what he's done. I constructed a little game. And what happens is the red line's above the blue line. That's not a prison dilemma. Actually, there's only one national equilibrium and it's that everyone does the right thing. It's the prospect of being um, harmed by tariffs that makes you cooperate, but once you have that threat and there's no retaliation, everyone does cooperate, so you get full cooperation in, in uh, climate change and you get free trade. So again, this is like the best outcome, kind of like the Montreal Protocol. And this is just a pure co cooperation game. It's, it's like a trivial game. Now, uh, if what I want to do now is take away this assumption here, which I don't think is reliable. You take that assumption away, and one possibility is that game that was a cooperation game becomes a prisoner's dilemma. Well, then this doesn't help at all. Another possibility is it could be a coordination game. Okay. If it is, though, it's going to have to have a large tipping point. And so Astrid and I are going to do new work to see whether it's possible for countries to negotiate around something like this. But what I would point out, um, the main thing I'd point out is, or two things. One is that the club idea I, I'm not very fond of, partly because I think what you want to do is take a multilateral approach to this and not have uh, subsets of countries act. And secondly, um, that this will only work if the, um, if the trade cooperation is much more valuable to countries than climate cooperation which may not be the case at all. Okay, so I'm now moving towards the final part of the talk. This is more speculative. So what's gonna happen now? So one thing that'll happen is the climate will get worse. Uh, better for some in the short term, by the way, right? There could be some winners and losers. But generally speaking, things will get progressively worse. What that means is that the incentives individually for countries to act will increase. So you'll see more countries doing more. And you might think that's good, but actually they're always going to be way behind where they should be collectively. So everyone's doing more, but collectively they should be doing even more than before. So what might look like some progress won't be. Um, another thing that might happen is there's a miracle. Uh, in particular on the technology side, suppose there was a technology that was as good as fossil fuels for producing energy, but with zero greenhouse gas emissions and was cheaper than fossil fuels under any and all circumstances. Well then, the markets, I didn't sound like an economist up to now, but the markets, you can call in the Chicago boys now, the markets will ensure that this technology will spread and you don't need treaties or any of that business. Markets will do it all by themselves, okay? But I do call that a miracle. 
I don't think we can rely on this happening. Another possibility is we look to a backstop. And there is a technology that some people are looking at called direct air capture. Well, they're going to have these machines. These are, I call these upside down fly swatters. And you've got a bunch of them here in the desert. And these are concentrated solar power uh, facilities here where they're producing energy without any emissions to run these machines. These machines are exposing a chemical sorbent to the air, taking CO2 out of the air. That CO2 will then, they'll then store safely, uh, there's an issue I think we need to be explored, but safely underground. Uh, and we're gonna remove CO2 from the air, which means because we can scale this to any level, we can control the CO2 level in the atmosphere independently of our economic system. This is just a project we have to pay for. And we don't have to change behavior, because everything I've been talking to about up to now has been about changing behavior. This is about paying for a project. Now, the difficulty with this technology, the biggest difficulty, I would say, is the cost is probably very high. Um, but I think we should be spending more resources uh, in exploring what the costs would be, also what the risks would be. And quite astonishingly, by the way, there are some scientists that wrote recently in Science Magazine saying that we shouldn't do this. That if we think we have something like this as a backstop, we, um, we won't bother to reduce our emissions. Oh, come on. The, the, the idea that this is why we have not reduced emissions, I think, is completely implausible. And I think this is crazy. I think we should be investing money to, um, to find out what the cost is. That's the backstop. And this addresses the root cause of the problem, which is there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere. But there's another thing we can do, and it's going to be a lot cheaper and a lot easier, but probably a little scarier. And that's the fallback, which is called geoengineering, or sometimes it's called solar geoengineering. Some people call it solar radiation management, <laughs> which I find frightening as a term. Uh, geoengineering I kind of like because it makes you feel this is scary. Uh, but solar radiation management sounds like advanced beekeeping or something. I, I just don't take that seriously. This picture here is Mount Pinatubo. It erupted in 1991 in the Philippines. Threw all this ash into the stratosphere. It actually lowered mean global temperature about half degree centigrade and kept it lower for, for about two or three years. And the idea is that we're going to engineer volcanoes. We'll actually do a better job than the volcanoes. Um, so we don't need to put as much ash and we can put it up the higher end of the stratosphere directly. And we're, gonna, we're going to offset the effect of concentrations in the atmosphere by reflecting sunlight away from Earth. <coughs> we know this is going to work. Now the thing about this that's so interesting, well one is it's not a substitute for limiting concentrations. So it has a different effect on radiative forcing. Okay, so you could limit temperature but it's not the same as dealing with the problem. Okay, just want to be clear about that. It's cheap, incredibly cheap. So most analysis assumes it's zero because it's so cheap. The reason we won't do it won't be because of cost. And finally, and very importantly, this can be done unilaterally. So now we have a technology that's very different. It's actually the opposite of what I've been looking at up to now. Unlike the person's dilemma here, a country can do it on its own and actually may well want to do it on its own because it's so cheap. So in many ways, the collective action problem is a governance problem. Who gets to decide whether, how, under what conditions this could ever be done? I think what's probably, we're just, these are such early days, I think it's, what's likely is that if one country were to try to do it, I think what will happen is other countries will try to do something else. And you'll have a lot of different types of geoengineering and we are going to be, we're, so now we are modifying the climate inadvertently. We are moving towards a world in which we are going to accept, and some people embrace the idea of modifying the climate directly, deliberately. This leads me to the novelist. How do you think about a world in which our relationship to technology, our, one another through our institutions, and the environment, nature itself, will be transformed because of all these incentives and our failure to act. 
the source that comes closest to, to thinking about this for me was uh, Brave New World. I don't know how to do it. I've deliberately not modeled this one problem because I, I think the modeling implies you know something, and I don't think we know very much at all. The last thing, my last slide, this is for Yulia. This is a painting by Paul Nash, uh, and it was painted, uh, he was at the front in World War I, and he was an eyewitness to um, you know, the worst of human nature, and he wanted an image that would communicate to people back in Britain how awful this war is. And he painted this picture of nature. There are no, there are no humans here. There are no human visual casualties. Uh, but what you see here is the sun rising over a landscape of desecration. It looks to me like a graveyard, but it's all natural. And what I really like about the painting is not just the painting, but the title of the painting, we are making a new world, which of course he meant to mock um, what the politicians were saying about the war. But I think this is what we're doing with climate change. We are making a new world, and I don't think we're prepared for how to deal with it. Thank you.